Architecture affects us much more immediately than many of the other visual arts because we're really confronted with it constantly. We live in it, we work in it, we shop in it, etc. Um, it really satisfies the basic human need for shelter. Um, architecture becomes a symbol for safety and security and it reflects human development. It connects the past to the present and suggests a sense of permanence or maybe a sense of place. Um, now, with this section, I've actually decided to split it into two parts. So we'll have two um, recorded video lectures on architecture. Now, since we're not dedicating a specific week to the history of art and architecture, I'm trying to sprinkle as much of that in throughout the other sections. So um, again, I've split this into two parts just so we can look at a bit wider variety of architectural forms. Um, but architecture more than any other art form really demands structural stability. However, it also requires thoughtful design um, to reflect the building's function and its intended role within its community. So the ancient Greek architect and philosopher Vitruvius taught three aspects or three things to consider of architecture. Um, first is firmitas, does it stand or will it fall apart? Uh, second, utilitas, is it functional? And third, venustas, which is, is it beautiful? And so your book sort of classifies these into three categories that are maybe a bit easier to understand. Um, structure, function, and form. Um, so you can think of these as three primary concerns of architecture, with structure being the most basic. Um, Really, since the earliest human settlements, architects have been attempting to erect roofs and kind of cover empty spaces, as well as set walls upright in a stable fashion. Now, there are two basic families of structural systems, the shell system and the skeleton and skin system. Um, so shell construction is essentially when the building materials provide the structural support as well as the visible exterior covering. Um, this is suitable for buildings made of things like brick, stone, um, adobe, or maybe even heavy kind of wooden timbers like a log cabin. Um, the other type is skeleton and skin construction, which is more like the human body. There's a rigid skeletal support system that forms a basic frame, and that is covered over with a more fragile, sort of lighter weight skin covering. Now, an architect's choice of structural system often depends on the available materials, um, and some materials are better suited for certain systems than others. Um, no matter the system, though, the point of these systems is to channel forces um, that act upon the building to the ground. So these forces, which we also call loads or stresses, um, they can be permanent or they can be temporary. So permanent unchanging loads are things like the building's own weight, which is the primary load that it needs to support. Um, and this is really caused by the constant pull of gravity um, downward on those materials, right? Now we also have temporary or changing loads, which would be things like people or furnishings within the building, or maybe a heavy snow settling on the roof, um, the wind blowing really hard against the wind, <clears throat> excuse me, against the building, or maybe the earth shifting and settling, seismic activity, things like that. So again, regardless of the materials or the structural system used, um, the building is trying to deal with these loads either by pushing or pulling them. Um, so an element that is pushed, we say it's in compression, uh, it becomes shorter whereas an element that is pulled is in tension. It is lengthened or stretched. So the ability to withstand loads depends on the tensile strength or the ability to withstand tension and the compressive strength or the ability to withstand compression of the materials. Now essentially all materials possess some of both of these, but not in equal measure. Stone and concrete have great compressive strength, but very little tensile strength. Wood possesses about an equal amount of compressive and tensile strength, but it's certainly not as strong as steel. 
Um, so the architect really has to work to create balance between that push and pull, between the tension and compression, um, in order to create a long lasting building. And so to do so, they really have to consider um, the location of the building, its purpose, as well as the availability and cost of materials. So the most basic form of shell construction would be load-bearing construction, um, which is essentially stacking and piling. Um, it's very simple, probably the most simple method of building. Um, it's suitable for brick, stone, adobe, uh, ice blocks, as well as some modern materials. Uh, basically, it just involves piling layer upon layer on top of one another. You start with a wide base um, and then progressively get smaller as it rises, um, which creates a sort of stair step like stack. Um, so the weight of the structure is concentrated at the bottom, which makes it very stable. Um, however, these structures tend to have few, if any, windows or openings within the walls. So here we are looking at a Mayan temple on the Great Plaza in the city of Tikal, Guatemala. Um, now this was built sometime between about 300 and 900 CE, and really it's just a great height and mass made possible through load-bearing construction. We have these layers of stone that have been carefully stacked. The weight is balanced evenly, which hold the stones in place. Um, so rising out of the Guatemalan rainforest, we have this um, sort of stacked pyramid that symbolizes a gateway to the gods. Now at the top there, at the top there, there's sort of a superstructure um, fixed or sat on, on the peak of this stack. Um, inside there, there were three rooms. Um, where Mayan priests would enter and conduct their religious ceremonies. The South American Incan Empire ranged from about 800 CE to 1527 CE, thereabouts. Um, by about 1500, the empire covered over 2,600 miles of the west coast of South America, um, including most of present-day Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, parts of northern Chile and um, part of Argentina. Now, the image we're looking at here is Machu Picchu. You probably recognize it. It's quite iconic. Um, and this was a royal estate built for the first Incan emperor. Um, it was built in the 15th century and it's about 9,000 feet above sea level. It's situated on a sort of mountain saddle that overlooks a river. And it was really a place for the emperor and his family to come and have feasts, religious ceremonies. Um, there are temples and sort of sacred stones scattered throughout the complex here. Um, there was housing for elites and sort of the retainers and staff of the royal family. Um, shrines, fountains, terraces, all sorts of things here. But the Inca are really known for their impressive stonework or masonry, and this is essentially um, stacking and piling. It's load-bearing construction, right? Um, so these are granite stones, which remember we discussed granite um, in the sculpture talk. Um, it's quite hard and dense, so it's kind of hard to work with. And the Inca had very simple um, tools, mainly heavy stone hammers. Um, and you might notice, looking at these two images, this is what's called dry stone. There is no mortar to help hold these blocks together. Um, now, the one on the right side here is rather irregular, where the one on the left is more regular, kind of smoothed and evenly spaced. So a commoner's house was probably the more irregular one, whereas palaces and temples and things had um, smoother surfaces and um, more evenly cut blocks. However, in both situations, the stones would have some sides that protruded slightly and other sides that were slightly concave. And so they would sort of fit together or maybe socket together, you could think of it. Um, to hold them in place and really hold them in place without the use of mortar, right? Um, so the Incan architects would have sort of chiseled and chipped away until the stones fit, fit together almost perfectly, um, but they weren't so fixed together that they would collapse during the many seismic um, 
activities of the area. Um, and then most of these structures, you might notice in this picture, um, the roofs are missing. That's because most of these structures would have been covered over with a wood or thatch roof. So um, materials that would have decayed. Here's a wonderful example of monumental architecture made from very simple techniques and materials. Um, this is the Great Friday Mosque at Jene in Mali, Africa. Um, it was originally constructed in the 13th century, but that was actually destroyed and replaced with a smaller, more modest mosque um, at some point. However, um, the current building, the one that we know, was completed in about 1907 and purposefully done more along the lines of that original mosque structure. So. Jinni has long been a trade center and site of Islamic learning and pilgrimage in Mali. Um, and so the Great Mosque is situated right next to a huge bustling marketplace. Um, so there are people kind of coming and going all day, every day. Um, and this is actually the largest mud brick building in the world. It's constructed out of adobe or sun-dried bricks that are made of dirt, water, straw, dung, kind of anything that's on the ground in this area. Um, and then those bricks are covered over with mud plaster to sort of give this plastic sculptural quality to these large imposing walls. Um, so there's a sort of gentle tapering of the walls that speaks to the stacking and piling of bricks. Um, which there are also very small windows that sort of pierce these walls and allow little shafts of light into the prayer hall. So again, speaking to that idea of load-bearing construction. Um, now, there are these three sort of towers here. Um, these are minarets. Uh, minarets are specific parts of Islamic architecture, which we'll talk a little bit about that a bit later. Um, but these are essentially towers that were used to call the faithful to prayer. Um, so inside those towers are spiral staircases that you can climb to reach the roof. And so here you can see the roof. Um, we have this ventilation system here, uh, these little mounds with holes in the center with little sort of metal or maybe terracotta caps on top of them. Um, so those caps can be removed or placed over the hole to either keep rain out in the rainy season or to open them and allow for ventilation when it's hot. Um, and then the mud brick also is really great about absorbing heat, so it keeps the interior of the space pretty cool during the day, um, but also pretty warm at night when it cools off outside. Um, now, you can also see on top of these minarets, we have this kind of conical structure, and that is topped with um, an ostrich egg. Um, ostrich eggs are important symbols of fertility and purity um, to the people in Jene, um, so kind of a special little feature there. And you might have noticed these wooden beams that line the surface um, of the structure. These are also um, visible on the interior. It sort of creates this distinctive look. Uh, some of these are supporting the ceiling, um, but these protruding beams on the exterior are used for annual maintenance. Um, they help to anchor scaffolding and the people of Jene climb on them so that they can reach all parts of the wall while they are doing the annual replastering. Um, so with mud brick, it does crack or sometimes sag, especially during the rainy season when it's getting wet sort of constantly. Um, so it needs to be resurfaced quite often. Um, so I'll share a video on Blackboard about the annual Jene festival of resurfacing the Great Mosque. And here's just one more photo of the Great Mosque of Jene. Um, from a sort of aerial view just so you can sort of see the entire structure. Um, so again we have the front, uh, the facade here with those three towering minarets. Um, the roof here, this is sort of a flat roof covering the prayer hall and in the back there's kind of an open courtyard but you can also see in this photo that mud brick or adobe architecture is is common in 
Mali and in many parts of Africa, as well as other areas in the world, um, specifically America as well, right? So, so we could also look at the ancient Puebloans of um, North America. These indigenous peoples also used local materials to sort of build very practical structures for shelter. Um, sometime during the late 12th century, uh, presumably drought, uh, dry conditions pushed these ancient Pueblo peoples um, to abandon their homes on the canyon floors within New Mexico and move north to what is now southwest Colorado. Um, and so here we have what's called Cliff Palace at Mesa Verde, Colorado. Um, this was constructed and inhabited from about 1100 to 1300 CE, and it's a series of communal dwellings made of stone, timber, adobe, um, all built within the ridges of these cliff faces high off the canyon floors. Um, so the location here really takes advantage of the sun's orientation. Um, it allows the Pueblo to be warmed in the winter while the sun is shining on it, but it places it in the shade in the summer when it's hot, right? Um, and then additionally, this is um, sandstone rock, so rainwater, when it does rain in this very dry area, it will sort of soak in and seep down through the layers of sandstone here until it hits a layer of shale, which is not um, porous, so it won't run through it. Um, and so when it hits that shale, it has to find another way out of the rock. And so it travels over to the edge of the cliff face here where it then runs down the side. So being situated right here on the cliff face meant that these ancient Pueblo peoples could collect rainwater right here, um, even if it hadn't rained for many months because um, the water that's in that rock will take a long time to kind of find its way back out, right? Now again, this is pretty simple load-bearing construction, stacking um, and piling of, again, stone, timber, adobe bricks, things like that, but this site was abandoned sometime between about 1300 and 1540 potentially because of increasingly dry periods, um, but we're not quite sure why these people left. Um, however, their descendants uh, continued to build adobe architecture. So here we are in Taos, New Mexico. Um, the Taos Pueblo people are descendants of those ancient Pueblos. Um, and this is a site of adobe architecture that was built in about the 14th century. Again, it's a communal or multi-family structure. The character is derived from the available materials, so again, an area with an abundance of sand and clay, um, but there's probably also some sort of communal or cultural um, standard in place here um, for the way the building would look or function. Um, now, Pueblo women were considered the owners of the homes rather than men, um, so they were the ones who were <clears throat> excuse me, who were responsible for the construction and maintenance. Um, so again, load-bearing architecture. We have rows of adobe bricks that were stacked um, and then plastered over with mud plaster, similar to Jene. Um, and again, this would be replastered every year. So we don't exactly know why the people, the Pueblo peoples left the area of Mesa Verde, but it's kind of interesting that this location, Taos, was constructed sometime around the same moment that Mesa Verde was abandoned, sometime between um, the late 13th and the early 14th, 15th century. Um, I'll share a video on Blackboard about this as well, but um, Taos is still inhabited by um, the Taos Pueblo people. Um, so it has been continually lived in for about 600 years now. The second most basic construction system after stacking and piling um, is post and lintel construction. So this consists of two uprights or posts which support a horizontal crosspiece or a lintel or sometimes it's called a beam. Um, so post and lintel or sometimes post and beam. Um, stone and wood are really the most common materials for this type of construction, but 
Neither has really great tensile strength, so it's difficult to span long distances without uh, caving in. And post and lintel construction has been in use since antiquity. Um, here we have the Temple of Amun-Ra at Karnak, Egypt. Um, this is a series of post and lintels that span sort of side by side and create a spacious sort of interior-like court. Um, we call this a hypostyle hall, essentially a large interior space, but it's full of columns uh, that support a flat ceiling, so it's not open or uninterrupted. Um, here at Karnak, the hypostyle hall was used by priests for rituals to worship the god Amun-Ra, while the common people stood outside in an open courtyard. Here we're looking at another hypostyle hall, this one from the Temple of Luxor, Egypt. This was constructed beginning in about 1390 BCE. Um, here the stone columns have been carved as bundles of stylized papyrus flowers, um, or buds rather, um, and these support rows of heavy stone lintels, each spanning about two columns. And then those lintels in turn would have supported a stone slab ceiling or roof, um, but remember the stone has a relatively low tensile strength, so the columns must be really closely spaced. Um, so this large hypostyle hall is really more like a forest of columns. Um, however, the ancient Egyptians associated that with the primordial swamp of creation. Um, they believed that the Nile Delta, the marshy kind of area um, around the river, was where the first mound of dry earth rose up from the swamp at the dawn of the world. And so that connection here is clarified through the design of the columns as these stylized plants from the Nile marshes. Um, and then additionally, this hypostyle hall would have been surrounded by um, a load bearing wall as well to sort of enclose it. Um, and then that load bearing wall would have had small windows pierced near the top in what's called a clerestory uh, to sort of allow light in, but it would have been quite dim, um, not very bright. Post and lintel construction was also a use in ancient Greece. Um, the columns here are quite a bit thinner than those in Egypt, um, but they have distinct features that allow them to be the essential points of support for the entire structure. Um, so there are three parts to these columns. Um, at the top we have a capital that serves as a transition point from the horizontal lintel to the vertical shaft or post, um, which is the second part of the column here, right? And then at the bottom we have the base of the column or the stabilizing point where the building, um, or excuse me, where the weight of the building is concentrated. And so the ancient Greeks uh, really standardized and sort of codified post and lintel construction into three major architectural styles, which we call the Greek orders. Um, the first of those are is the Doric order. Um, the Doric order is the central one here. Um, it's kind of a plain rounded uh, shaft with n no or very little base. Um, and this sort of plain rounded stone capital here. Um, and we'll look at, you can sort of see it in this photo of the Parthenon, but we'll look at the Parthenon a little closer a bit later, so keep an eye out for those. Um, the second one is Ionic, so that would be the one on the right side here. Um, ionic columns have slightly thinner or more slender uh, posts. They have, <clears throat> excuse me, they have a stepped base and then they have capitals with these curling, almost scroll-like features that are called volutes, V-O-L-U-T-E-S. Um, and then lastly, the most sort of ornamental of the three orders is the Corinthian order. It's got a very kind of detailed decorative base and capital. The capital is carved in um, stylized acanthus leaves. Um, so here we have the Temple of Athena Nike from the Athenian Acropolis in Athens, Greece. Um, it's believed to have been designed by the architect Callicrates, who also worked on the Parthenon, as we will discuss later. 
Um, but this is a small temple that was made to house a statue of Athena. Um, so you can see we have this stepped base um, of our column here and scrolling volute capitals so that would make this an ionic temple um, and then these columns support what's called an entablature which is essentially this rectangular chunk here and then that can be further divided into uh, the architrave the frieze and the cornice um, so architrave frieze cornice the frieze is really an area for um, relief sculpture, kind of decorative, um, and the cornice is just the little part that protrudes um, kind of over the edge there. Um, and then above that, it's missing on this particular temple, but above that would have been a triangular, what's called a pediment, um, kind of the pitch or the gable of the roof there, um, and that would have been another place that sculpture could have gone. Um, if you want to learn more about the specific parts of Greek architecture, um, you can look on page 380 in the Gateways book, and it dives into that quite a bit. Um, but for now, we're going to move on. Um, the ancient Greeks really did have quite a lasting impact on Western architectural traditions. Um, the Romans picked up and developed the Greek styles even further, um, and then later in the Renaissance during the 15th and 16th centuries, and then even after um, on into the 17th and 18th centuries, um, there was a revival again of this interest in sort of the classical architectural style here. So we see uh, movements called neoclassical architecture or kind of new classical again. Um, so these styles, these orders, we still see them in use today, specifically in government buildings a lot. Um, if you think about the Capitol building, um, it, it looks a lot like this. So the post and lintel system works really well, um, but there are some issues. The span of the lintel is determined sort of in part by the material. You can't have a very long span of stone, for example, without cracking or collapsing. Um, and gravity really pushes down sort of in the middle of the lintel, so the longer the span, the more likely it will collapse. Um, also, post and lintel is really limited in height and width by the size of the lintel and the number of the uprights. Um, so those really determine the size of the entire architectural space. So around the same time that the ancient Greeks were developing their post and lintel system, um, so sometime around the second century BCE, Chinese architects and other ancient Eastern architects um, were developing a similar system. Um, except they didn't use stone, they used wood. Um, sometimes this one is referred to as post and beam rather than post and lintel, but essentially it's the same. Um, so this is a technique that was developed, again, around the second century BCE in China, and then later adopted by Japan in about the sixth century. So we're looking at the Buddhist Horu Temple in Nara, Japan. It was constructed beginning in about the seventh century. And these are some of the oldest wooden buildings in the world. Um, so in this system, we have cross beams and counter cross beams that create a series of layers that support this kind of elaborately curved roof, um, which when we zoom in in a moment, you'll sort of see the roof sort of seems to float above these incredibly slender supports. Um, and that's made possible because of an intricate system of interlocking brackets at the top of each column that helps distribute the weight of the roof and these sort of large overhanging eaves um, evenly onto the wooden columns, allowing each column to bear up to five times more weight. So here we have the main building of the compound. This is the condo or the golden hall, which is sort of like a treasure house. It was about 61 feet long and about 50 feet wide. Um, so we have this solid masonry platform with wood and white plaster. Um, and then on the exterior under the eaves there, you can sort of see the really fantastic bracketing system. Um, those upward curling eaves, the edges of the roof. We've got these dragons that sort of climb the posts here. Um, so quite a bit of Chinese influence and it 
looks like a two-story building, but actually it's not. It's just a single story, and on the interior, when you look upward, it's just a sort of um, network of rafters. And here we have the five-story pagoda from the compound. Um, so this is an impressive 122 feet tall, um, and really it was made for looks. It's not very practical. Um, it appears to be five stories, but again, I think you can only enter the bottom one or two, um, and then above that it's just empty space. Um, and the pagoda, it wasn't really meant for people to be meeting inside of anyway. It's more of a reliquary, a place to keep special relics and, and things related to religious beliefs. So it makes sense that they wanted it to be more impressive than practical. Ancient Babylonians in Mesopotamia and ancient Mycenaeans in early Greece um, attempted to increase the height of their interior spaces through corbeling. Um, so corbeling involves the stepping inward of successive layers of material. Um, so essentially brick, stone, wood, whatever, is laid together in a way that one end is sort of pressed under what's above it, and the other end sticks out, which we call a cantilever, which we'll talk about more um, probably in part two of our architecture chat. Um, but bit by bit, it slowly works its way up um, until it meets in the middle. So we call it a corbelled arch, though it's not technically an arch, it's just an adjusted post and lintel system. Um, but it does allow for um, more spacious interiors, but it's still susceptible to gravity. Here's an example of a corbelled arch at what's called the Treasury of Atreus in Mycenae, Greece. This was built in about 1250 BCE. Um, so you can see down this passageway we have um, our corbelled archway, which we have a lintel that sort of interrupts the arch, but that's just for added support. Um, and then on the interior, we have a huge tomb chamber. Um, this is a circular room. It's about 47 and a half foot in diameter and about 43 foot tall. Um, and it is a corbelled vault so that's built up in sort of regular courses of these precise blocks. Um, no mortar holds them together, but they lean in smoothly to meet at a single capstone at the peak of the dome here. Um, and then the entire thing on the exterior is covered over with earth, um, transforming it into sort of this conical earthen mound. Um, and that dirt on top really just helps um, secure the stones in place.